Okay, good afternoon. Good, all right, let's try it one, one more time. Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Feng Sheng Hu, the Richard G. Engelsman Dean of Arts and Sciences. And it is my honor to welcome all of you to the installation of Corina Tritale as the William Elliot Smith Professor in History. I am delighted to see so many familiar faces gathered here today. And I would like to offer my warmest welcome to everyone joining us on our live stream. Thank you for helping us mark this special occasion. We are delighted to have a few of Corinna's, wow, <laughs> a few of Corinna's family members in the room today, and they include Christopher Knapp, Corinna's husband, Isabella Tritale Knapp, their daughter, and uh, Svang Tritale, is he here? No? Okay. Will Corinna's special guests please stand to be recognized? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, I always look forward to participating in installation ceremonies like this. These special events provide an opportunity to pause a busy day, busy days, and come together as a campus community to celebrate a colleague's exceptional teaching and scholarship. It is a time to reflect on past accomplishments and a moment to recognize the abundant promise on the horizon. As spring approaches, now I'm, I'm a plant biologist, remember, as spring approaches, it feels like the campus is experiencing new burst of energy and life, not just for the plants, for everything else too. But even in the cold winter months, arts and sciences has been growing. We are now two years into our strategic plan, and every season brings us to brings us closer to achieving the tremendous vision that we set for ourselves. The decade of arts and sciences will transform the intellectual landscape of Washington University through outstanding research and scholarship, making a model for universities around the world. This is an ambitious goal, and it is our shared vision. Our core values are exemplified by so many of our leaders, staff, students, and faculty, including today's honoree, Corinna Tritale. As professor and chair of the Department of History, Corinna is a champion of interdisciplinary scholarship, boundary-breaking research, and academic excellence. Her research and teaching are focused on German-speaking Europe and the fascinating ways that science, medicine, culture, and politics have intersected over the past three centuries, including how that history affects us today. Corinna's passion for collaboration across disciplines is well known on this campus and has elevated the collaborative scholarship of Washu. Her interest in the history of health and medicine led her to co-found Washu's medical humanities minor in 2015. And she continues to work with scholars around the world to inform health humanities research. She also co-leads a research cluster in the incubator for transdisciplinary futures, one of our eight signature initiatives in the arts and sciences strategic plan. And the cluster has the name of Science in the Public Square. This project brings together faculty and students from the natural and social sciences, the humanities, and the fine arts to study the trust or mistrust in scientific authorities as a recurring social phenomenon. Truly very timely and impactful work, for sure. And in just a few minutes, you will get to learn more about Corinna's impressive scholarship from Professor Peter Castor. Of course, installation ceremonies like this would not be possible if not for the general support of our alumni and donors. 
We are here today thanks to the incredible gifts of the Smith family. The late Alice E. Smith established this professorship in honor of her husband, William Elliot Smith, a prominent St. Louis businessman and philanthropist. William Smith was born in St. Louis in 1844 and received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Washoe. His family ties to this institution were undeniably strong. His father was a close friend of William Greenleaf Elliot, who was, who was called one of the earliest and most faithful friends of the university. Smith's uncle was also one of 17 charter members of Washoe's board of directors. After graduation, William pursued a successful career in fruit crops, of all the things, fruit crops. In 1873, he and a friend purchased a small glass factory in Alton, Illinois. Illinois Glass Works grew to cover 50 acres and generate millions of dollars worth of inventory. William served as president of Illinois Glass Works and eventually became the owner and president of several subsidiaries dealing with the manufacturing and marketing of his glass and bottle products. With a strong interest in history, William enjoyed traveling throughout his, throughout his life and sadly he died of pneumonia in 1909 while traveling with his family in Italy. Alice Smith and her daughters shared William's passion for Washoe, in addition to funding the professorship in history in 1921. Their generous gifts established the William Elliot Smith Memorial Fund for scholarships and significantly contributed to the construction of the Women's Building. We know that countless students, faculty, and members of the Washoe community have benefited from these gifts. Our, our ceremony today adds yet another chapter to the Smith family's story and preserves their 100-year legacy at Washoe. It is because of their generosity that we can recruit and retain very best scholars like Corinna Tritail. It's hard to imagine a more fitting tribute to a family of history enthusiasts. And now I would like to invite Peter Castor, Professor of History and American Culture Studies and former chair of the Department of History, who also wrote the nomination letter that landed this professorship, uh, to the podium to share more about Corinna's impressive career. Thank you, Dean Hu. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you here and to all, have all of us here for this wonderful moment. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce my colleague and my friend, Corinna Tritel, and I'm delighted by the opportunity to learn about the past from Corinna. As we hear her remarks today, I'm very much looking forward to that. Now, Dean Hu has introduced Corinna to you as a university citizen. I'd like to introduce her as a historian and as a member of the department. I do that with some degree of anxiety because we are so well represented here by members of the department. I await their grade on this presentation. Now, usually these introductions are made by the current chair of the department, but, well, obviously that's not possible today, so I'm just very grateful to be able to do this. What I want to do is to try to channel what I've seen in the way that Corinna writes her history and the way that she speaks to her students. I will attempt to be clear, which Corinna always is, to be thoughtful, which she always is, and when she gives her remarks, I plan to listen respectfully, as she always does in all gatherings. So Corinna's a historian of modern Europe. It sounds simple, right? Not so fast. Modern Europe is, of course, one of the most densely studied and most intensely debated of historical fields. It's tough to find a place of one's own. It's also a field that some historians guard jealously. It's full of baggage, more than, and more than its share of bad behavior. And I, write, I say this as a US historian, and we've got plenty of baggage and bad behavior. 
I want to raise the degree of difficulty here because Corinna is a historian of modern Germany. Few places are more complex, more demanding, more fraught with difficult ethical questions, moral landmines, and competing interpretations. It's within this contested world that Corinna operates, one in which she shines, both because she is a great scholar, but also because rather than seek to outfight or to tear down others about old questions, she has always sought to find ways to bring historians together in collegial ways as they ask new questions. Her research is wide ranging, but as we just heard, much of it focuses on science, on medicine, and one of my favorite subjects, food, because I'm a big fan of food. Um, her work is both top down and bottom up, and that's what I've always enjoyed so much in reading it. It is in part the story of how intellectuals, scientists, physicians came to understand health, food, and the environment, but it's also very much the story of how average Germans understood what was healthy and what was not, what they should eat and what they should drink and what they should not. One other thing I would add here is Professor Tritel always understood that academic research needs to be not only deeply cerebral, but it needs a hook, a way for students to understand it, a way to engage audiences. And that starts with good titles. I tried to find the flyer from her job talk when she came to the university. I did find the email we received with the schedule of your visit, but not the job title. So I'm going to go by my memory. If I remember correctly, the job talk title is Why Was Hitler a Vegetarian? I remember that almost two decades. Did I get it right? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear it. It was a really provocative title and definitively a memorable one. And it was for a talk that wasn't really about Hitler, but rather reflected the transition from her first book on the occult in Germany to her second book about food in Germany. And it really worked. Likewise, her second book title has the simple opening of Gesundheit, exclamation point a term we all know, followed by a description of it as seeking German health, 1750 to 2000. Now, in some ways, we operate on very different wavelengths, Karina and I. She's a historian of Europe. I'm a historian of the United States. We study different subjects. But we received our PhDs in the same year. We joined the history department faculty only a few years apart. And from the start, from the moment she arrived, it was clear that she was thoughtful, level-headed, always committed to what was in the best interest of our students, our colleagues, our department, and our university. And she has served all of these constituencies, both wisely and generously. Over the years, I came to admire both her research and her teaching, and to rely on her as a force for good within our department. Now, Dean Hu has told us about William Elliot Smith, and I'm, deli I'm always delighted to hear the origin stories of these professorships. As Corinna is installed this day, let me also add the story of the illustrious company that she joins. Many professors have held this. I only want to mention one or two here. J.G.A. Pocock, an extraordinary scholar who passed away in December of last year at the age of 99, Rod Berthoff, who was a long-serving chair of the department, one of the first senior faculty who was retired, who I met when I arrived. And of course, Derek Hurst, who is with us today, a magnificent historian and a supportive colleague when Corinna and I arrived. Derek recently had a professorship established in his own name, and the inaugural recipient of that uh, professorship, Steve Hindle, is with us today. Previous uh, William Elliott Smith professors have all been important historians. And I'm delighted to see Corinna join their ranks, not only to have her among them, but also the ways in which her research, her teaching, and her leadership elevate that company. Thank you all for being here today. I'm delighted also to once again have the opportunity to learn about history from Corinna Tritel. Thank you. Corinne, come up. <laughs> OK.
Okay. Professor Tritel, I present you with this medallion, beautiful medallion. It's a symbol of your new appointment. And the front says, William Edith Smith, Professor in History, Arts and Sciences, Washington University, 1853. Engraved on the back, Corinna Tritel, March 28th, 2024. So here, here comes. <laughs> <laughs> And the new tradition, new tradition is that you keep this on, 24/7. <laughs> uh, only Isabella can help you. <laughs> it's a new tradition. <laughs> it's of today. So congratulations. Well, thank you, Feng Shang and Peter, for those introductions. I almost don't recognize myself um, in what you said about me. And thank you, everyone, for coming on such a beautiful day um, at this time in the semester. I know it takes some real dedication to show up um, at the end of a Thursday. Um, so I'll keep my remarks brief uh, so that we can enjoy ourselves in the reception. This is an unexpected honor for me. I never aspired to having a named chair. And it's really um, part of an unexpected career. That's the title of my talk. We'll get to it eventually. <laughs> so as many of you know, I actually studied chemistry in college. And I plan to become a scientist. This article, which I published with my research group in 2012, is not in any activity report I've submitted at WashU. <laughs> it is not on my CV, but it is in the Journal of Organic Chemistry. Instead of becoming a chemist, I earned a PhD in history and became a German historian. And my students often ask me, how did that happen? So here's the answer of the day in three objects, a book, a piece of concrete, and a photograph. Here's the book. Early in college, I heard a talk by the woman who wrote this book, Evelyn Fox Keller. She had a PhD in physics, but she was talking about gender and metaphor. I did not understand very much of what she was talking about. But what stuck with me was the memory of a woman scientist who fearlessly crossed disciplinary lines to investigate the questions that most interested her. I bought the book. This is my beat up copy. Um, and she became a role model. Yeah, what's that? This is a piece of concrete. So after college, I worked in a biochemistry lab. And then I started a graduate program in the history and philosophy of science, planning to specialize in philosophy and then get back on track with a PhD in biochemistry. Feel free to laugh. These are the crazy things that you can only believe yourself possible, uh, b believe yourself capable of when you're in your 20s. But then something really surprising happened. The Berlin Wall came down. And I found this so interesting that I went to Berlin, where I hammered out this piece of the wall, and I talked with people about what was happening. And my experiences there caused the history light bulb to go off in my head. I was watching historical change happen in real time. And I went from being someone who had not found history particularly compelling, you might want to rethink that hiring decision, <laughs> colleagues, to all of a sudden, it made incredible sense to me. And I decided not to become a biochemist, but to become a historian. Oops. Ah. OK, 
There's the photo. So when I arrived at a new graduate program in history, yes, this guy is sitting in the audience right, <laughs> right here. <laughs> I had the great fortune to take a seminar with a new faculty member we started the same year named David Blackburn. I really liked the way your head worked. Uh, and rather than finding fault with my less than stellar historical knowledge and skills, I was about half a click away from being a, a scientist, right? David welcomed me into his class and convinced me that the German past was the perfect place for me to investigate the questions that interested me most. Everything that's happened since then has been a long and wonderful surprise. Oops. Oh. Ah, OK, that's what we want. So let's talk now about disenchantment and um, some of the historical puzzles that I've been interested in. So my research, as uh, Dean Hu mentioned, uh, is concerns the traffic between science medicine and popular culture. I've investigated what it's like to live in a world where scientific knowledge and method carry great authority. I've wondered about questions like this. How has science shaped what we are able to know, believe, value, imagine, resist, deny? What's it like, in other words, to live in a disenchanted world? So that phrase, disenchanted world, comes, um, well, it actually doesn't come from him. It comes from someone who made it famous, uh, Max Weber, the German social theorist Max Weber, took it from someone else. Um, and a disenchanted world is one in which, and I'm going to quote him here, one can, in principle, master all things by calculation, unquote. So the disenchanted world, allegedly, is different from an earlier social order in which religion grounded collective identities. Our world is the disenchanted world. It's the one that you and I live in. Um, it's the one in which science and its rational spirit have become the arbiter of what is true, possible, and desirable. So what's interested me in my scholarship has been how disenchantment plays out at the interface of science, medicine, and popular culture as experts and lay people wrestle with the possibilities and limits of belief, imagination, creativity, even reality, in a world where one can, in principle, master all things by calculation. So since that's kind of abstract, let's see if I can, ah, yes. I'm going to talk about three puzzles that have interested me. The first one is German occultism. So here's the puzzle. Germany was a world leader of scientific and medical progress in the 19th and 20th centuries. At the same time, it hosted one of the Western world's most vibrant and influential occult movements. How did those two things go together? I was curious about scientists like Carl Friedrich Zollner, a well-respected professor of astrophysics, he actually coined the term astrophysics, um, at the University of Leipzig, who conducted experiments in the late 1870s with the American medium Henry Slade. So for those of you who don't know about seances, let me tell you a little bit. Um, so in these experiments, Slade would fall into a trance, and then he would cause these amazing things to happen. He caused a compass needle to deflect without a magnet, messages to appear on a slate without a writer, a musical instrument to play without a musician, and four knots to appear in a continuous circle of cord without moving his hands. That's what you're looking at there, his hands having just accomplished this amazing feat. Zollner published an account of these experiments in 1878, claiming to have founded a new branch of science called transcendental physics that would study the fourth dimension of space and all the forces that were operating there. Controversy broke out right away. <laughs> Wilhelm Wundt, a pioneer of modern experimental psychology, was there, and he cried fraud. But many others followed Zollner into the seance room. Some came to investigate the fourth dimension. 
Others hoped that trans phenomena would reveal the non-waking structures and powers of the human mind. Their experiments became inseparable from the emergence of modern psychology, 20th century notions of selfhood, and other aspects of modernism. And I'll give you an example. This is the example of a Munich artist by the name of Albert von Keller. He worked with physicians on experiments with a medium by the name of Lena Matzinger. What he, the reason he went into the seance room and did these experiments is that he wanted, he was interested in liminal experiences between waking and sleeping, life and death, and he wanted to paint life and death experiences in this particular image with physiological accuracy. So this painting of a woman being burned at the stake drew on photographs he took at seances as Motzinger fell in and out of trance states. Now, if you think this is weird, think again. Um, Keller was no anomaly in finding inspiration in the occult. Many of the great figures of 20th century Western art, I'll name just two, Vasily Kandinsky and Jackson Pollock, also found inspiration there. And the examples could be multiplied from writers who use spirit guides to write in subliminal states to police departments who hired telepaths to solve crimes in the big city. All of them were playing with the possibilities of disenchantment. So once I was done with occultism, my inner scientist rebelled. I'm pretty sure I would have been beating Wundt to the door in the seance room, right? Crying fraud. So my inner scientist rebelled. And um, I decided that I needed to work on something much more concrete. So I turned to food. Germany, as many of you know, has long been a world leader in inventing more natural ways to eat and farm. Why, I wondered, had this dream of eating naturally so captured Germans' imaginations? Where did it come from? And what had been done in its name? I was interested in moments like this. This is the Dachau concentration camp, an aerial shot uh, from 1943. And if you look at the top there, I've indicated in red uh, two organic industries. One is a farm, and the other one is a factory that turned um, the produce of the farm um, into saleable items. So Dachau was Nazi Germany's first concentration camp. It belonged to the vast uh, system of camps that came to include the extermination camps uh, that we're all familiar with, places like Auschwitz. Nazi Germany's camp system is the ultimate example of a disenchanted world. It was a place where medical experts conducted horrific experiments on human subjects, calculated down to the last decimal how few calories you had to feed a prisoner before useful uh, uh, work could no longer be extracted from their body. They also provided careful justification, infrastructure, and administration for genocide. Dachau also contained an organic garden where prisoners were forced to raise herbs for the country's racial elite. What's going on there? The organic techniques used at Dachau came from an influential but poorly understood subculture called anthroposophy. Some anthroposophists in the years between the two world wars um, had huge farms in eastern Germany, and they were really worried about the introduction of newfangled chemical fertilizers, right? Synthetic chemical fertilizers. They worried that these were depleting their land and might cause a dust bowl right, in uh, their region of Central Europe. And so they began to talk about finding more natural ways to farm and began to talk about the soil as being something that wasn't dead, but that was alive and needed to be treated as if it were an organism. Their experiments drew on homeopathic ideas about the efficacy of minimum doses, astrological notions about the phases of the moon, and clairvoyant meditation sessions over seeds. 
clearly the occult was not finished with me. But they also drew on the work of early soil biologists who at the time could not get a job in a university uh, because agricultural chemistry, not agricultural biology, um, dominated German universities. There, uh, these anthroposophists also drew on the new laboratory technique of chromatography, whose inventor, M.S. Twett, had just won the Nobel Prize. Today, this early form of organic farming is called biodynamics. It's widely practiced, and it's beloved by celebrity chefs. Perhaps more importantly, its central insight about the soil being alive informs sustainability strategies around the world. Its path into a concentration camp is too long a story for today, but hopefully you see the larger themes here. The organic herb garden at Dachau underscores the rich possibilities of disenchantment at the borderlands of science, medicine, and popular culture. These days I'm interested in health consciousness. How did Germans come to know that they should brush their teeth twice per day, wash their hands with soap before every meal, bathe at least once per week, exercise three times per week, eat five fresh fruits and vegetables today, uh, per day, and other things like that. Health consciousness is that voice in your head and mine that tells us what we should be doing to care for our own health. How did it get there? Things like that don't just happen. Over the past 200 years, a lot of effort has gone into putting that voice in our heads, driven in part by the needs of modern states and modern employers for strong soldiers, fit workers, and fertile women. But how do you get people to care about your health? Anyone who watched the CDC try to convince Americans to wash their hands with soap for 20 seconds while singing happy birthday twice, then put a mask on to go outside. Well, no, it's really not that easy. I'm in interested in the history of such efforts, what we now call health education or science communication. It's an important and underfunded branch of public health, and our own Institute of Public Health uh, here at WashU lists 20 faculty in this area. So I'm interested in moments like this. This is the transparent person who was a life-size talking statue introduced in 1930 by the German Hygiene Museum. It was an instant hit. After 1933, the Nazis built racial consciousness on the body of this statue in exhibits seen by millions, both at home and abroad. After 1945, as the two Germanies sought to overcome the infamy of Nazi medical crimes, the transparent person was pressed into service as a global diplomat, going to Vietnam in 1958, transformed into a cow. Cassie, are you here? I put this for you. Transformed into a cow and sent to India in 1959, and even cut down to torso size, put on a bus and trucked around Africa in several tours in the early 1960s. Okay, so the transparent person was a really big deal. How do we understand it as a product of its time and place? Well, to answer, I have to backtrack a little bit. In the 19th century, doctors tried to build health consciousness by going into working class neighborhoods and farming communities to deliver lectures about what they knew best, which is what they had learned in medical school. That meant anatomy and physiology. Reactions ranged from boredom to outrage. Why? The disenchanted body on which modern medical knowledge rests is not always legible or even acceptable to lay people. Modern medicine was built on the dissection of human cadavers and experiments with living animals. Fears of grave robbers who supplied medical students with bodies to anatomize and ethical qualms about animal vivisection circulated widely. Even lay people who dismissed such fears 
um, as irrational, wondered why looking at a dead body told you anything useful about a living one, which I think is actually a pretty good question. But this was a big communication problem. The German Hygiene Museum overcame it by creating, well, we can use the Nazi, uh, the Nazi version, by creating this life-size statue that talked in a comforting voice about its inner anatomy, its inner physiology, as one organ system after another lit up. In other words, the Hygiene Museum reimagined scientific medicine for the age of mass culture by bringing the dead body back to life, and audiences loved it. The transparent person also worked by playing on popular notions of what a healthy body looked like. Consider the pose of the transparent person. Where does it come from? Well, it comes, oh. yeah, it comes from a well-known painting uh, done in 1894 uh, by the German artist Fidus. Fidus belonged to the same countercultural currents I've already alluded on, alluded to several times. These were alternative belief systems that mixed occultism, still not finished with it, <laughs> with Eastern religions, nudism, vegetarianism, anti-vaccinationism, animal protectionism, and oh, did I say eugenics. This painting, Light Prayer, in fact, captured a naturopathic pose. It's a naked body, arms raised, opening the inside of the body to the healing power of the air and sun. It became the iconic pose. We're not at final yet. Ah. OK. You don't get the middle one. So it became. You want to see? Oh, is it there? Oh, oh, good. Yeah. OK. It became the iconic pose of health consciousness for all Germans um, by the 1920s. So here, for instance, is a man who won a health contest in 1927 for a selfie um, showing how he kept himself healthy. It's the same pose that I just showed you. Um, here's the poster, hopefully, no. Ah, yes. Here's the poster um, for a blockbuster public health campaign that reached more than 30 million Germans uh, in 1926, same pose. So the transparent person co-opted naturopathy, which by the way was a strongly anti-vaccinationist strain of alternative medicine for the age of modern health communication. This is the dialectic, once again, of the disenchanted world, one in which the zone of exchange between science medicine and popular culture becomes a site of resistance, imagination, loud criticism, and quiet co-optation. It's what interests me. So I'll leave you with a couple of final thoughts. First of all, fingers crossed. No? Nope. Yes. My interest in these, all the things that I've been talking about has led to me to many wonderful collaborations here at WashU, and I see many of my friends and collaborators from this shared space out in the audience, and I really appreciate all of you um, coming today. So Medical Humanities, we did it together. We celebrated the Frankenstein Bicentennial uh, together, and now we're doing Science in the Public Square uh, together. It's been a really awesome experience for me. Um, and finally, I want to return to my opening remark about an unexpected career, right? not expecting to be a historian. Um, so I ended up here. Ooh, no. I ended up here. <laughs> So for those of you, those of you who are having trouble with this image, this is Adolphus Bush Hall, which is where the history department here at WashU lives. Um, and it used to be the chemistry building until I think the 1950s when chemistry moved out and history moved in. I chuckle to myself almost every time I walk through the front door of our building and I see chemistry chiseled into the stone um, over the front door. So I thought this was a really nice ending um, to my remarks. So thank you very much for coming.
What a fascinating talk. I'm going to take a class with Professor Chui Tao, assuming that she gives good grades. <laughs> so uh, congratulations again, Corina. And uh, I want to say congratulations to all of you to, to have such a wonderful colleague and, and just a wonderful department chair. I have had the pleasure of working with Corina over the past few years. Uh, uh, since she started as the department chair of the Department of History. And I can say that uh, Corina, Peter, and I have been working very hard to try to push this department to greater heights. And we are accomplishing a lot under Corina's leadership. So thank you for that as well, even though this is the, the all of today is primarily based on your research and teaching. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us today to recognize Professor Tritel's accomplishments and to celebrate the generosity of the Smith family. And this concludes the formal portion of today's ceremony. Please join us for the reception over there and offer your own congratulations to Corina and her family. Thank you so much. <laughs>